Hello, bonjour, and welcome to my three guest chefs and to the audience of this first of a three-part series about Provence. Information about the other episodes of this series and of other France Revisited conversations with experts are sent out through the France Revisited letter, newsletter. So if you're watching this in replay, please be sure to subscribe. I am so delighted to have these three notable chefs on the program today. I had the pleasure of meeting each of them in person while I was biking in Provence three weeks ago. I asked each of them at the time to introduce themselves on video, so allow me to run those three short clips before returning live. Bonjour, I am Chef John Chiri, and I welcome you to my little restaurant inside the central food market of Leal Avignon. Hello, my name is Hugues Marek and welcome uh, in Pernet Fontaine to my restaurant which is the Auberge de la Camarette. You are right here in the middle of the vineyards. And uh, the vineyards is owned by my wife, who's taking care of the wine, and I'm taking care of the restaurant. I hope to see you soon to try my uh, food and uh, the nice, beautiful uh, product from Provence. See you soon. Hi, my name is Nadia Samut. I am the owner and the chef de cuisine at Auberge La Fenière in Provence. It's just in between Lomarin and Cadenet. And uh, here you are on my property with two restaurants, my gastronomic uh, Michelin star restaurants and uh, my bistro just uh, by here. Um, I am very pleased to invite you to come and visit us in Lomarin uh, to have an experience of uh, sensitive and uh, conscientious uh, cuisine, uh, gluten-free because I'm celiac, but very open to a new experience and uh, nice products from the region here in Provence. Hello, Nadia Samut. Hello, Hugues Marek. And hello, John Chiri. Bonjour. Thank you all three for accepting the invitation to speak with me and to share with France Revisited travelers and armchair travelers from around the world your backgrounds, your approaches to cooking with the products and produce of Provence, and to discuss how you consider your cuisine Provençal or not. I also want to thank Valérie Gillet of the Vaucluse Tourist Board, with whom I discussed the many worthy chefs in the Vaucluse area of Provence before selecting these three. Why these three? Well, worthy as Nadia, Hugues, and John are, and as much as I recommend that you visit each of them when in Provence, I did not set out to select what rating systems or guidebooks might rate as top chefs, but to select three chefs that represent different aspects of cuisine in Provence today. Chefs of different backgrounds, who've had very different career paths, and who now work in different areas of the region and in different settings. Jean Chiri is from California and now has a restaurant in an urban food market. Hugues Marek is from Brittany and has a restaurant and inn among the vineyards. And Nadia Samut has roots several generations deep in Provence in the hills of the Luberon, where she has a restaurant and a hotel that feel both rooted and a world apart. Each of them shares a love and an appreciation for products from the region. Also, they're all in their 40s, so old enough to have much varied experience, yet young enough to have substantial careers ahead of them. Each of them might be considered as entrepreneur chefs since they run varied businesses centered on their culinary skills. Finally, they are all very well-traveled and fluent in English. John, of course, because he's from California. Ugg spent three and a half years in the United States in Sun Valley, Idaho, as a young chef, as well as working in England and Ireland. And Nadia is a world traveler who is very familiar with New York, among other places. Before speaking with each of my guests, I'd like to set the scene of our culinary tour of Provence by showing you a map of the region and some of the local food products for which it is known. We are in uh, southeast of uh, France. Um, the region is actually called uh, Provence uh, Alpes Côte d'Azur or Pro Pro Provence Alps Riviera, uh, but it's easier just to think of it as a thousand, southeast uh, France. And this area is, this region is divided into six uh, departments. In American terms, it's sort of like a counties, counties within a state. Uh, and so we are specifically in the Vaucluse uh, area of the, the region. 
Now, Vaucluse itself is not just Provence. Provence uh, goes much wider. So I'm using the term Provence, but we're actually in a very specific um, area, sort of the heart of, uh, of Provence. Uh, and this is Provence, it, it does actually does not exist as an administrative region. It's a historical term um, because it was an independent state at uh, a certain time uh, in, in history before the French Revolution. And here you're seeing on the right, you're seeing this image of uh, more or less what historical Provence would be. Uh, so it actually goes over into what is not the region Provence out Côte d'Azur. And it's a ill-defined, once you get to the edges of it, it's not always easy to know exactly where Provence begins or e ends. There's a part of the Drôme, which is just to the north, which is considered very Provençal, uh, to the south of it. And Vaucluse itself, historically, uh, in a sense, was not actually called uh, Provence, part parts of it, because it was called the Comte Venessin. The uh, popes were uh, in uh, these were papal states, the uh, popes were in Avignon, and they were controlling uh, this area. But in general, today, when we're speaking about Provence, we're talking about this whole wide, uh, wide area uh, here, going from Nice, of course, we call this the Riviera, but just behind the Riviera would begin uh, Provence. So we're specifically going to the Vaucluse uh, area, and uh, Avignon is its capital, and it's the uh, place where a traveler would normally arrive, if, if, especially if one arrives, flies into Paris, one would take, could take the train down to Avignon and then begin one's ex explorations in larger Provence or in the Vaucluse in, in uh, particular. Of course, it is possible to drive up from Marseille, which is not uh, very far away. Uh, but generally one arrives in, uh, in Avignon. My own uh, approach, whenever I go, I go to Avignon and then I either rent a car or more recently I've been uh, biking, which I did uh, three weeks ago. I met these chefs as I was on a biking trip uh, in, the, in the area. Uh, John is in Avignon here, which is the uh, capital. Um, Hugues is in the uh, town of uh, Pernes des Fontaines. He's actually just outside of the center of town in the vineyards. And um, Nadia is uh, down here in an area. This is an area, a beautiful area called the Luberon, which was the uh, main destination of my biking trip a few weeks ago. And uh, Nadia is just outside of the village of, uh, of um, Lomar. Lomar. Uh, just a quick, quick run through of some of the products um, that are available um, immediately uh, in uh, the, the Vaucluse. Uh, there's, uh, I'm just going to run through these quick, quickly. Well, most of these pictures are thanks to the um, Valerie and her uh, tourist board. Um, the, there is a time, you know, we, we, it's well known. Everyone, I'm sure everyone has in their, uh, in their cabinet, kitchen cabinet, some herbs from Provence. Uh, there's thyme, there's uh, basil, uh, there's uh, saffron, uh, there is, of course, great uh, fruit, uh, great vegetables, zucchini, uh, tomatoes, we often see. Uh, this is a dish called a tiens, tiens de, de légumes, which is these uh, finely cut um, uh, uh, vegetables. Uh, white asparagus, which I had some great white asparagus at, uh, at Hugues, uh, Hugues uh, restaurant. Um, uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, there is squash, there are artichokes, the garlic, of course, uh, truffles, cherries. When I was there a few weeks ago, the cherries were just uh, were just getting uh, ripe uh, red. Uh, this was not my picture, but this was the kind of image I was seeing as I was uh, biking around. Uh, strawberries, figs, uh, very famous for its uh, Cavaillon uh, melons. Uh, there's a well-known chef who, and his daughter, who is very specialized in using melons um, uh, in Cavaillon. A uh, lot of, because of all the fruit around, there's candied fruit. Uh, olives, of course, is a big uh, olive uh, oil producing region for France. Uh, there are almonds, and there are many, many vineyards. Uh, this was actually my, the one picture of mine that I slipped in here. Uh, yes, it was just beautiful views all around. And uh, this is uh, Valerie's picture, actually, of Chateau neuf du uh, bottles. And so there are wines. We're in the, uh, 
in the Rhone Valley, uh, Côte du Rhone uh, area, with these different appellations, uh, Chateau Neuf du Pape being the most famous of them, but uh, Gigondas, Vaquiras, uh, et uh, cetera. And maybe I didn't uh, list them list them all. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, no image of Provence would be complete without some lavender. Uh, when I was there a few weeks ago, it was just, just, you were just starting to see a little color uh, come. And so there's probably more uh, now. Do you see uh, color around, uh, Nadia? You, you see? Yes, yes. No. Yeah. no. We didn't see it uh, yeah. uh, before. Uh, John, I'd like to speak with John first because John is actually the uh, person who he works, uh, he has a restaurant at Leal, which is the covered food market in, um, well, Leal in French is a covered food market and he works at uh, the central food market in uh, in Avignon, where he has a, um, a, a little restaurant. Uh, the three chefs see uh, pro fresh produce all the time, but John is surrounded by it uh, every day that he, go and he goes into uh, Leon. Um, first of all, John, how did a, a nice guy from California end up in... <laughs> Ooh, uh, well, the, the, the short, short version the short, the, short, is, the short version. Yes. The short version is I came to Europe to work as a stagiaire, <clears throat> I had one stage planned out in a Michelin star restaurant in the Black Forest in Germany. And then I kind of, I gave myself a year to find what I could get myself into. And so I was in Berlin and then I found a stage in Barcelona and I was crossing France in the train on my way to Barcelona in Germany when I got a phone call telling me that a French friend I worked with back in Louisiana had left Louisiana and had moved back to France and was working in a famous restaurant, La Mirande, in Avignon. And I thought, and I said, that's great, cool, I'd love to see Seb, but I don't know where Avignon is. <laughs> and I have no plans to stop in France. And then, so got off the phone call and about 15, 20 minutes later, they announced that Avignon was the next stop. So I made a quick surprise visit, jumped off the train and ended up being offered a job. No, and that was what, uh, when, 20 years ago or so? What, when was that? This was 19 years ago, yeah. 19 years ago, 2002, yeah. I guess. Exactly. And, uh, I should say that uh, of the three chefs, John's, I did not eat at John's restaurant when I was there a few weeks ago, uh, but I first met John when I was with some people in, uh, in Provence, in Vaucluse, uh, several years ago and uh, asked him to come, uh, we were in a villa, and asked him to come to be our private chef uh, one evening. So that's how I got to know uh, John and his wonderful cuisine. Uh, so when did you uh, move to the, when did you open the restaurant at uh, Leal? Uh, that would be towards the end of 2017. So it's still, a, it's still a baby, we'll say. And I should note that because I made a mistake with the timing, so the kids are still here, and so they might jump in, and, and the little ones might climb on me in a little while. But <laughs> okay. they have something. Uh, maybe they can tell us about how you make puree for babies or something. Uh, well, I don't know. They can cook themselves, so they can, <laughs> at least they're... the five-year-old can. Oh, okay. <laughs> and so the uh, uh, what what. California, California, Central, you're from Central California, Central California, that has lots of agriculture uh, there. Do you find any similarities between the availability of produce uh, in Avignon or Provence compared with uh, Central California? Not so much where I grew up and the time that I grew up there, uh, because I grew up in Davis, and which is just next to Sacramento, just next to the capital, and I was surrounded with cornfields and rice paddies. Um, which don't necessarily sound like they would go together, but hey, they made it work. <laughs> um, and the countryside here doesn't resemble so much Davis, but when I went to university and particularly when I started in fine dining down in Santa Barbara, the countryside resembles the back country of Santa Barbara. Once you get off of the beach, it resembles Santa Barbara a lot. So once you get up the hill in Santa Barbara and then back into the valley, it's a spitting image of the countryside outside of Avignon, mm. uh, with the exception of all the historic buildings. <laughs> right, right. You've got plenty in, uh, in Avignon. Uh, I should say that all of these places 
for me, I mean, you know, Vaucluse, the Provence, it's such a place where we think of as lifestyle, that there are great monuments around, which I'm not showing just because this is not an actual, you know, I'm not actually giving a tour of Vaucluse, but, um, but I could just spend days going from village to village, town to town, square to square, just having uh, great meals and, uh, you know, sitting in cafes and, and drinking coffee or, or wine. Um, so that is uh, the, that, that experience of, um, of Provence through its food is, is um, I mean, it's true throughout France, but I think it's especially important in, um, in the Provence. And so you're right in the heart of it because you are seeing the food arrive every day and you see what's fresh uh, every day. Do you, does everything that you make come from Leal? Come from the, the vast majority of it. The vast majority of it, yes. And what, uh, what do you, well, what is your, how would you describe your cuisine? Oh, um, I'm always a little hard pressed to truly describe it. What I say is that it's based in local products. So I say it's based in Provencal products, but it's more or less French with a lot of American touches. <laughs> there are American touches? <laughs> That's about the best I can come up with for it. Yeah. Which really, I, there's not so many American touches I'd say in the dishes, except that I do do a couple American dishes like Louisiana gumbo, um, little things here and there. And I have just a different way of taking certain Classic dishes, we'll say. Mm. Uh, do you? How, how many seats do you have in your restaurant? Uh, it's minuscule. I have twenty-four seats in normal times. In COVID times, I have fourteen. <laughs> oh yeah, right. Uh, and uh, I know that you also. Um, so as I had, you know, gotten you to to cook uh, privately, I know that you also do uh, private, um, you know, uh, meals. And when you're doing that, do you? What kind of request do you get? Do you find that there's a special request for particularly Provence-oriented uh, food? I mean, what we would think of as Provencal, Provencal cuisine, or is it all all over the place? No, it's usually not that specifically requested, pure and simple. It's um, I end up talking. I developed a style. Either way, is that I talk to people who request me to come cook in their villas or in their winery or in their home, whether they're French or American or who knows what, um, where I like to talk to them about what kind of foods they enjoy, what they don't like, what their allergies are, of course, and if there's anything they'd like to discover. Mm. And so then I, the majority of the time, they leave me carte blanche to come up with a menu. There, the, I offer menu items that they can choose from, but very rarely, I'd say at least people coming from other countries who are coming to experience Provence, very rarely do they choose the menu items. They usually just leave it open. So. Uh, do you, uh, do you, are you very uh, vegetable based more than, uh, I mean, how do you, do you, do you work much with meat, uh, with fish, with, uh, I, I am asking this question because, when I had asked you to come to the villa, unbeknownst to me, I mean, I had asked you to come and then shortly before uh, you were set to come, I realized that it was, I was with two couples and that the, uh, the both women were um, vegetarian, which was a surprise to me, I didn't know. And you, I must say, adapted perfectly uh, to it. But in general, do you treat everything? I mean, are you an omnivore um, cook? Uh, I'm very much an omnivore myself, and yes, as a cook, I'd say so. But the beautiful thing about the cuisine down here is that traditionally it's very much not heavily based. It is very much fresh product, fresh vegetable based with, I mean, traditionally there's lots of little pieces of meat mixed in as flavoring or part of the cooking, as opposed to a big piece and everything based around that big piece of meat. Mm. So it adapts to it quite nicely. And we have so many good fresh vegetables here that it's quite easy to adapt to vegetarianism. Mm. Veganism is, is not quite as easy, but... <laughs> right, right. Uh, is there... Uh, well, we did have one vegan on that trip, too. But is there... Uh, are there certain... Uh, is there certain produce from the region that you especially uh, love uh, to, to work with? Yeah, but the list goes on. I mean, you showed the white asparagus... In season, the white asparagus and green asparagus are both spectacular. I mean, the cherries, we talked about that. 
they're coming to an end right now, but they're still hanging in. Um, but the cherries are fantastic. The multiple varieties of strawberries that ripen at different points throughout the summertime mm -hmm. so that you have beautifully ripe strawberries all throughout the summer with a lot of the times a little bit of a hole in August. I mean, but just the tian that you showed, all the good zucchini and eggplants and tomato based, the cooking is perfect for that. It's so, it's wonderful. The vegetables are so good. Mm. Are you, uh, you're, are you actually cooking in front of uh, people? Because I know it's such a small space that the, uh, are you cooking what at the same time? I mean, are you? Yep, everything happens in front of people. Yeah, everything happens in front of people. Uh, what's, uh, I, <laughs> for I, the good I, and the bad, I guess. <laughs> uh, that, that's good. I mean, are, are people uh, watching you uh, the whole time? Or do yeah. They, they yeah. The show? yeah, I think that's part of the charm of my place is that it's a very interactive, um, it's a very interactive restaurant. You know, you're not just going there for the dining experience because, I mean, the, the only bad review I, I've gotten in the restaurants, at least online, is because someone said it was too noisy, it was uncomfortable, it was too packed things like that. And, you know, it's inside the marketplace. There's a lot of commotion going on all the time around you. There's industrial noise. There's people walking by. There's people shouting to each other, saying hi. You know, there's me talking to people outside of the restaurant, people inside the restaurant. There's cooking noises. It's a very interactive place. And the vast majority of the time, a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I love um, uh, food market uh, restaurants. I know that there's a great one uh, in Toulouse that I love whenever I'm down there uh, to go to there. They're just such vibrant uh, and, and they're local, local places. Um, I, I say one thing about the um, both John uh, Yug and uh, Nadia, other uh, restaurants, is that they are very local places. Of course, a tourist will feel uh, very uh, welcome there. But there, uh, again, I was not at John's a few weeks ago, but being at Hugues and uh, Nadia's, they are, the restaurants are full at a time when so there are certainly no Americans traveling. There are not many um, tourists to speak of on the road when I was uh, there a few weeks ago, and the restaurants are full which is such a sign that they are local restaurants with such a local uh, and um, faithful uh, clientele. Um, I want to uh, move on a bit to uh, talk with Hugh. Just, I first want to go back to so, my- Gary, really quickly. Yeah. Yep. I don't know, again, I'm sorry, but with my mistake with the timing, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to stick around for the rest of the video call. Is there anything else you'd like to talk to me about? Well, I do want to ask a question. I was going to ask everyone at the end, but since you're uh, here and you might go, I want to ask, um, tell me, what are you making? What did you make for lunch today? <laughs> or what are you making tomorrow? Well, Wait, give, it, give, it, give me an example. Uh, okay, I'm a bit stuck here. I might have to ask you, Nadia, for a little translation help. <laughs> I made, <laughs> I made a marinated araña de porc. Uh, how, do you, how do you translate araña de porc? Say so again, a spider? It got cut off. Say it again. Uh, Araña de porc. Is that, does that translate as spider? It doesn't, does it? I mean, literally, that's what it means, but... Yeah. What is it now? I can't think of the English translation for it. Um, anyways, it's a particular cut of, of meat that is very flavorful and very tender, but it's kind of interesting because it's an intersection cut of meat between multiple more noble cuts, we'll say. It's a I think if I remember right, they refer to it as the butcher's cuts. You know, they save it for themselves back traditionally. Mm. But uh, yeah. And what do you serve? So I actually made that, I made that with an oven roasted ratatouille with no tomatoes. So my neighbor in the market yelled at me that it wasn't a ratatouille because there were no tomatoes, but I told him, hey, I'm American, I could do that. <laughs> right, right. It is true, you can get away with things. Um, but what, what's great is that the three, I know that the, the three of you uh, get away with things. I mean, Nadia is known for getting away with whatever she wants to do, but uh, uh, Yug as well was unexpected uh, dishes. Um, and so that's, it's great, that creativity. Uh, okay, well, I might have another question if you if you're stick around. I'll see if you're still here uh, later on when I'm asking more, when I have other questions. But thank you, John. Okay. Well, I might, have, I might have to jump on. And I just saw that someone's asking the name of my restaurant in the chat, just quickly to say, it's a Cuisine Centrale. Like, to play on words to be Cuisine Centrale, like a central kitchen, but it's Centrale, as in Leal. 
Hey, I'll, if you look towards the top of the chat, you'll see that I uh, put on, or Stephanie put on uh, John's uh, website. Actually, I put on jonathansherry.com. That's his website where you'll see uh, information about the uh, restaurant at Leal, as well as uh, his um, how to contact him for a private meal if you're down in a villa uh, at some point down there. And, and uh, if I can, I'll jump back on in a little bit. So Okay, okay. Uh, right. Let's see, I want to get back to uh, this because I just have a few pictures to show you before. Ah, there he is. Uh, since we're just seeing Uga, he's, he's actually, as you, you see him, uh, I mean, in our conversation, he's on his terrace. Here it was uh, my picture from a few weeks ago where this is the kitchen uh, right back here. And this is uh, the kitchen inn. I mean, it's actually called an inn, an auberge, because there are two um, two rooms, two guest rooms for a B&B. &B, and I stayed there for, uh, for the night. This is a view of the uh, building with the, uh, the terrace uh, about, I can't remember how many people, 40, 50, how many people do you have? Yeah. Between 40 and 50 outside. 40 and 50. Uh, just a wonderful, I mean, uh, for those of you who aren't, weren't yet on yet, uh, you, you said uh, when we were chatting just beforehand that uh, the weather has been beautiful and that every evening they've been outside. Of course, there is an indoor place, uh, indoor seating yeah. when, when necessary. But for now, everyone was outside as the evening uh, that I was there. Uh, this is a view from uh, my bedroom. Uh, there. So you're looking down uh, at the terrace and there are only two rooms. So, you know, as you can imagine, it's pretty quiet uh, after uh, everyone has left. And oh, there's Nadia. So that was the end of that um, small presentation. Uh, so, uh, Ug, uh, I know that you had this great, can tell us briefly, you had this great experience. You were between the ages of about 20, 23, 24, and you spent time in the United States and specifically in Sun Valley, uh, yes. Idaho. Yes, exactly. I, I studied uh, culinary school until uh, uh, 19, 20 years old. And I, uh, after the uh, big, being graduate, I had the possibility to, to work in, uh, in Sun Valley, Idaho. And I stayed over there. It was a nice place. So I stayed over there like uh, altogether three and a half years. Now you, uh, you you told me during our conversation piece you were there for a year and a half and then you came you came back and you traveled and then you went back for about two years, and then it was the uh, it was two thousand three it must have been two thousand three because it was the Gulf War and uh, during the Gulf War the Americans were not big on renewing lots of French visas uh, exactly. And so you were caught up in that and they did not uh, renew your visa to stay. So you uh, happily continued yeah. your career elsewhere. But if you had had that visa, do you think you would have stayed, would you have stayed in the, uh, in the US? I don't know, probably, probably, because it was a, a good place. I was having a beautiful job over there in the resort and uh, it was so, such a nice li life, actually. It was, it was nice, but on the other side, you know, it make me do something else, you know, travel in uh, in UK actually, and uh, because I the the visa was refused, so I, I find a job in New, in London near London. So it was a great experience as well, and my life was different. And today I'm here in Provence, so it's beautiful. And also, uh, I know that your wife Nancy, you met in Sun Valley because you yeah. were both, uh, you were both the same age and you were both uh, working there. Uh, I, I'll just uh, quickly tell, tell your own story, but uh, then you met again, you stayed in touch and you met again in London and that's when things really took off. And Nancy is from right where you are speaking to us uh, today because it's her family uh, vineyard um, and, uh, and fields because there's other agriculture uh, there. And so you moved to uh, Peon, you got, got married. Yeah. And um, and then so you pick up from there. So what? Uh, so you yeah. were not going to be a wine grower yourself, even though no. Nancy had taken Nancy and her sister. I know manage now the Domaine de la Camaret, mm -hmm. which is what the wine uh, the wine estate is called. And so what was your plan? 
other than so, so I, I arrived I arrived here in in uh, Pernay Fontaine in 2009 2010 and um, when I arrived here the first time in on the vineyard it's just a, such a beautiful place and there is a very whole as you see on on the picture Gary's picture it's just a, a, such beautiful building and there was nothing inside just some office and some uh, uh, place to, to to put the wine so we decide very quickly to open a restaurant but after a few years in the uh, uk and uh, working in a big restaurant with a lot of staff i decided to open a small restaurant at the beginning it was a small restaurant working by myself making my my home vegetable, my home fruit. So I was taking care of the garden and I was uh, only serving at night some uh, product from the garden. Like that's how we start to have the idea to make the auberge. So after we work on this idea and after one year working in a, a restaurant uh, uh, near my place here, I decide, we decide to open the, the, the place, the auberge de la Camarade. Uh, and uh, right, you told me that originally, uh, so you were just having a single set uh, menu, like whatever you were making, that was yeah. the, uh, the meal. You, you then uh, hired uh, staff, and, but you decided to continue with the idea of a uh, set uh, menu. Now I know there's a choice, it's just a, this is a set appetizer. There's a choice between main courses, a fish and a meat, and then, uh, which can be adapted if someone's vegetarian. And then there's a uh, dessert and it's served with wines, uh, with your wife Nancy's uh, wines, which are yeah. mostly Ventoux uh, appellations, Cote de Ventoux. Uh, so why that uh, choice to have a, a limited, whatever I cook, you're gonna eat um, approach? There's a few idea on that. It's the, the first idea is uh, is is of course to work, try to work alone at the beginning. After a few years, I find it was difficult because the restaurant get bigger and bigger. So that's the first thing. The second thing is to work only with fresh product. So I receive fresh product every day, and we work the product and we serve what we got, and that's it. And we start again the next day or or two days after. And, and the, the, the last point, but which is, I think, the more important point for me, it's when I think of restaurants sometimes, you know, I just want to feel comfortable. And I have the idea of this auberge, the traditional French auberge, which is uh, you arrive at night, you can sleep or not, and you have some, a meal, uh, uh, and the, the, you just have a small menu, or, and you don't have much choice, and, but you just enjoy the place where you are and you trust the chef and you trust the house. So it's what I try to do here. And working like that, I realize uh, because you don't have the choice, sometimes you will try things you will never choice in the, in, on the menu, on the traditional menu. So it's the way I like to, to play as well with people to make them try things a little bit different. But of course, when people, they have allergy or they can have or they don't like something we always propose something else uh, and uh, you uh, so your your wife's family has the, this vineyard but they also have agriculture around so you're surrounded by these products i mean you you order uh, others you know from other neighbors as well but uh, you do you so you clearly are very based in the region in your yeah. um, in your in your cuisine. What is the? Um, you're from Brittany originally. Do you feel that you're making? Are you are you making a Provençal cuisine? What is Provençal cuisine these days? Yeah. That, that, that's a big question. What's Provençal cuisine? Um, I'm not making a, a traditional Provençal cuisine because I'm open all year round for. And we start with local local uh, customer. Now we have some tourists, of course, because the wars getting bigger and bigger, and and so we we have uh, a lot of people coming from all around the world. But uh, actually, we don't do Provençal cuisine because in Provence, for local people, Provençal cuisine is very traditional. It's the dish most of the time you will do it at home on Sunday Sunday lunch, for example. Or, or with all those traditional dish. We do some uh, evening during winter, for example, with a uh, uh, game, uh, with uh, like truffle and more traditional Provencal dish. But the idea of my cuisine is to have 
to work on uh, to have the idea of the Provencal dish and to twist it and to work around. But we're not doing real Provencal cuisine, but mm. working with local product, fresh product all the time. And um, like you say, we have the wine here. We have the olive oil as well from the domain. We have some uh, cereal like lentils and stuff like that. And all around the, the restaurant, we have some people making some beautiful vegetable and fruit. So what, what you have to imagine when you think about, about Vaucluse, if you never come, it's, it's like a big garden. And for a chef here, you have the obligation to work with fresh produce because they are all around. You have market all the time. You have uh, people working uh, vegetable and fruit everywhere. So you have to work with fresh product. It's an obligation. Mm. And, to, and you have to do it right. You have to uh, honor the, uh, the fresh produce that, that's, uh, that's, that's coming in. Do you, uh, I, I want to say as an aside to everyone as I'm speaking with these chefs, um, uh, I feel that necessary to give you a sense of price. Um, not that I want to talk about price, but uh, just to help uh, distinguish a certain amount of what we're talking about is that uh, John's restaurant, if I understand correctly, you would go for lunch and it would probably be 25 euros with a, a glass of wine or so. That's maybe $30, $30. Uh, Hugues uh, restaurant is a set menu of uh, 38 euros is that correct yeah. yes uh, please with the, with the wine is yes with, with the wine, wine with, with the a wine. small with a small aperitif uh, homemade uh, and uh, starter main course dessert and the wine of the domain and uh, so 38 euros and maybe that's about 45 uh, 45 dollars and Nadia who I'll be speaking with uh, in a moment who has a, a Michelin star and is clearly a gastronomic restaurant is uh Maybe uh, I can't remember exactly 160, 180 euros. Yeah. Is that, that right? Right, 160. Yeah. Right. So we're talking about three different things, even though we're talking about the same uh, products in uh, the, the same produce from uh, the Vaucluse um, as we're uh, speaking about it. Uh, so you uh, now, when I was there, uh, I, I would say uh, like uh, Hugh, Hugh and I were both talking about it and how the the term um, semi gastronomic is not. A good uh, a good term to describe anything, but but not to describe. Uh, I would describe it as a, a very polished um, way of using fresh produce uh, from the region and uh, beyond when uh, when necessary. For example, the evening that I was there, the two choices of a main course were a uh, cod dish, and cod is certainly not from uh, Vaucluse, and a rabbit dish, which was from uh, uh, Vaucluse. So do, how do you feel about using products from outside of the region? Does it bother you? Do you feel it natural or do you feel no obligation? You just want to... What? No, there's no, there no obligation to use only product from the, the Vaucluse. And it's an obligation to use um, vegetable for me, for myself. It's an obligation to use uh, um, fruit and vegetable from the Vaucluse. Uh, after that's the base. It, the, the vegetable here is always the base of the dish. And As after, I say, I had a, a delicious uh, appetizer of vegetables, including the white asparagus. Uh, yes. Uh, and like yeah, like you say, it was uh, right in the season of the asparagus, so we have we have to have started with asparagus. Um, but uh, what I was going to say. <laughs> Uh, the obligation you don't have an obligation to no use. no it's not an obligation after you, you, i don't want to stay only with uh, uh product uh, like meat and we use meat from most of the time from here because we use lamb or pork from the ventoux and the lamb from the alpi uh the rabbit is from uh, vaucluse as well but uh, for fish it's much more it's more difficult like last week we have trout from here but you know we don't do, do trout all the time so we want to do different things as well and because we have a regular customer, you need as well to change your menu. And, you know, I mean, as soon as you take a good product, fresh product, it doesn't matter if you take cod or another fish or, or beautiful beef from Charolais or from France, everywhere. Uh, it doesn't matter. The idea, it's like I repeat, but it's vegetable and fruit from here. And 
fresh and nice product from France. Uh, well, not to mention that since you are from Brittany, you are authorized to, uh, which is such a fish and seafood uh, area, yeah. you do, you are authorized to uh, reach back to your past in, uh, in, in that. Uh, I'm going to return you to, to you with other questions, but I want to, um, for now, move on to uh, Nadia. You can stay with us, Hugh. Right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Move on. Click on the link in the description section of this video to go to part two of my conversation with chefs of the Vaucluse, especially featuring Nadia Samut, chef at La Fenière in the Luberon, along with further comments by Hugues Marek in Perle Fontaine.